itadakimasu. Welcome back to Bento Bureau, the show where we talk about Japan from an international perspective with a side dish of socio-political discussion. I'm your host for today, Buzz, and with me on my left is Long from Vietnam. Good morning, everyone. And on my right is the one and only Bastian, who's joining us for today for a special episode. Hello, hello. It's a pleasure to be back. How's it been, Bastian? I haven't seen you in a while. Um, everything is going well, yes. You're studying uh, your master's degree in Sheffield in, in the UK, aren't you? Yes, I am. So why are you back here in Japan? Because I have nothing else to do in my life. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we are really grateful to have you back in Japan. Thanks. It's been a while. But straight to the topic, today's topic is about minorities in Japan. Speaking about a group of people by the name, quote-unquote, Burakumin. And for that, we have invited an expert, as usual, Professor Christopher Bondi, who has done a lot of research on the topic of Burakumin. Specifically, his specialty is on the role of education in teaching children and students about Burakumin, because Burakumin actually, as a minority group, face discrimination in Japan since all the way back hundreds of years ago in the Tokugawa regime. So it's going to be a very interesting episode. We're looking forward to talking about the subject. We'll be focusing on what Burakumin is, the history of Burak- the Burakumin people, and then we'll be speaking more about. Christopher Bondi's research on education, which he conducted in a few Buraku districts in Japan. Professor Bondi is a sociologist from the International Christian University in Tokyo. Professor Bondi, welcome to the show. Thank you. In one of our earlier episodes, we talked to Professor Tom Gill from Meiji Gakuin University about his research on homelessness. The story of how he developed an interest in this topic is quite fascinating. He came to Japan initially as an English teacher after graduating from university with a degree in English literature. And without a particular future goal in mind, Professor Gill was working as a journalist for Kyodo News when he received a task to edit an article about the killing of a day laborer by the Yakuza in Sanya, Tokyo. And as he jokingly remarked, 10 years after that 800-word article, he completed a 10,000-word doctoral dissertation on the same topic. But today, we are with Professor Bondi, who researches a different group of people. Professor Bondi, how did you start developing an interest in Burakumi? It's a good question. In a way, it's not too different from um, from Professor Gill's experiences. I, I too spent uh, a couple of years teaching English in a public junior high school here, and one of the schools where I taught had a, a sizable Buraku population. My desk at the time happened to be next to the teacher who was in charge of being the liaison between the Buraku district and the school, and he was passing me materials that I was simply using to study Japanese and learn a little bit more kanji and things like that. But it was primarily based upon Budaku issues. And when I went to graduate school, I read a book called Learning to Labor, um, How Working Class Kids Get Working Class Jobs by a guy named Paul Willis. In reading that, it basically gave me the thought about how were the Budaku students experiencing school. And so that was sort of how I got into my doctoral research. But the, the Budaku issue in general was based upon when I first came to Japan, gosh, almost 30 years ago now, I had taken a class and, and the professor talked about who the Burakumin were, but then said they didn't really exist anymore. And I, I found that very interesting to think about how different groups get marked and marginalized in Japanese society, which was different from the way that I had understood markings of difference um, from where I grew up in the United States. When you take a look at the way the Japanese are portrayed in Japan, it is easy to assume that there is something exotic about its identity, especially when you look at the media. And not only that, for example, even the Japan's Prime Minister Nakasone claimed in 1986 that Japanese racial purity is what makes Japanese people more intelligent than Americans. Professor Bondi, how do you see the construction of the Japanese identity? Using the Nakasone quote as your starting point, I think... There is a long-standing ideology trying to create a uniform sense of experiences and perspectives of a group of people as, quote-unquote, the Japanese. And 
the Métis state made a conscious effort to try to join and link people from various parts of the archipelago that had very different sets of experiences and historical legacies to create this new modern, if you will, um, Japanese identity of creating the sense of connectivity and belongingness to the nation state. With the, um, the inclusion of Hokkaido and the inhabitants there, the Ainu and Okinawan and the, from the Ryukyuan Kingdom, Japan was already not um, monocultural. And certainly as Japan expands um, and adds um, Taiwan and Korea to its colonial holdings, we have a very multicultural society. This belief of the, the myth of homogeneity, so to speak, of a singular Japanese identity is very much a post-war perspective that belies Japan's history and even is, is incorrect even in contemporary Japan. This idea of somehow all Japanese having the same sets of experiences and all being part of the same ethnic heritage or ethnic stock. Nakasone's perspective, while that may be a sense from certain strands of Japanese political and social elites, um, certainly was not does not match the reality and groups, Ainu groups, Okinawan groups, Budaku groups, very much have challenged that perspective throughout for, for decades now. That's an interesting factor to mention because I think it's very important to talk about what it means to be Japanese when we talk about the subject of Burakumin. Because it's all about perception, right? The whole the whole concept of burakumin is all about perception and how they differ from normal, quote unquote, normal Japanese. So, having studied the burakumin, could you tell us what is the origin of this minority group? I guess when when we think about who who the burakumin are, there are multiple ways of kind of thinking about this. One is how do we think about how certain groups get marked, and how does that marking become sort of a, a social process and becomes routinized into every into common thinking or understanding. Now, to go back historically, during the Tokugawa period, we had the um, status system, the Mibun Seido, or as I always, as a non-historian, I always talk about it as the spam system of um, samurai, peasants, artisans, and merchants. And then outside of this hierarchy, we had a number of outcast groups. Those outcast groups were involved with a very a variety of occupations, but they had tended to have monopolies on certain occupations, like caring for the dead, be it people or animals, butchering of animals, leather work, bounty hunters, traveling entertainers. In other words, people who were not settled within this, this sort of framework of the spam system. Interestingly, though they were marked as different by occupation, many, particularly those who were involved with butchering, grave digging, tanning, things like that, were also involved in farming. And while they were discriminated against during the Tokugawa period based upon occupation, as Japan opened up to the West and modernized under the, the Meiji state, the outcast groups were quote unquote liberated and were then referenced on the actual government document, new commoner, so that they were, the government was now registering people as former outcasts. They also, during that period, then lost their occupational monopoly. And so they were then marked not by occupation as much as by areas of residence. And so that's where we get this term, burakumin, is literally people of the hamlet coming from these specialized ref, um, areas of residence. Just like the majority Japanese as an identity had to be created through education, through sort of a reference of who, who the emperor was and the role of the emperor in the state, there had to be a way of creating and marking these other groups as being different. And again, the role of the state in creating these quote unquote new commoners became one of those roles. And so we have what was an occupational marker of difference getting rolled into now a geographic or residential marker of difference. So the term Burakumin was actually a term that was created later after the Tokugawa regime? That's correct. So Burakumin um, came out of a term of Tokushu Burakumin, of special hamlet, the residence of special hamlets. And so that is a, um, a Meiji era term. M much like there, was, there wasn't really a Japanese, there, were, there weren't quote unquote Japanese people in the archipelago during the Tokugawa period because there wasn't a Japanese state. Why do you think these people were considered outcasts in the first place, just because they don't fit in the hierarchy of spam? It's an entirely arbitrary system. 
And I think we can look at it in, in kind of one of two ways. One is the, the status hierarchy, that spam system, was an incredibly regressive system whereby the peasants, the artisans, the merchants were taxed heavily and had to pay in rice much of their um, income to the samurai, to support the samurai. And though the samurai were a very small portion of the, the greater population, it was in the interest of the samurai to make sure that there was a degree of, of conflict between these different groups. So all the groups outside of other than the samurai didn't band together to try to challenge the system. So they could say to the farmers, the peasants, you're being taxed heavily, life is rough, but we can also get these outcasts to do it too, thereby pitting those groups against each other. So that's, that's I think, one way we can think of it. The other thing that really gets at the arbitrariness of it all is that of the outcast, what was considered an outcast occupation was not uniform throughout the archipelago. In other words, what could be considered an outcast occupation in one part of the country would not be considered an outcast occupation in another part of the country. This was not something that was the Tokugawa shogunate down to everybody. It varied locally, which meant that this was not a national system as much as it was a localized system marking certain groups or certain families or certain areas as somehow different from other areas. So, Professor Bondi, how would you this system explain the identity of the Burakumin? One of the challenges of trying to think about the identity of Burakumin is, of course, just like any any group, there's a wide variety. So I want to make sure that that's clear. There's, there isn't one Buraku identity by any stretch. A, a number of ways of thinking about this is that Buraku identity or identities more more correctly, are in a way have to be created as well, right? Because the Burakumin themselves as a construct were marked and created and exist as a group based upon the marking and discrimination by, by the broader society. To create a Buraku identity has to then come out of an identity of the experience of being discriminated against, right? So we can we can think about a Buraku identity in contemporary society, not necessarily based upon any clear-cut mar- demarcation, but rather as a set of historical experiences and ways of thinking about that that are surrounded by these issues of discrimination. Professor, I find it very interesting that the Buraku identity was a construction based on discrimination. In Yoshio Sugimoto's book, Introduction to Japanese Society, he uses a set of seven categories to identify the Japaneseness of an individual. For example, number one, nationality and citizenship. Number two, pure Japanese genes in quotation mark, languages, competencies, place of birth, current residents, level of cultural literacy, and their own subjective identity. While cultural literacy and the subjective identity can be a bit harder to identify, the other fives are pretty straightforward. How would this system explain the identity of the Burakumin in the contemporary Japanese society? Um, well, I think... You know, using Sugimoto's categorization, certainly from nationality, quote-unquote genes, as he, as he describes it, cultural literacy, linguistic abilities, all, all these markers are the same for those from Buraku districts and majority Japanese. There's no, there's no difference there. What we get then is sort of these ideas of, of self-identity. One of the areas where I did, did my research was very much about trying to encourage people to to have a positive Buraku identity, to be proud of being Burakuin. And as one of my informants, an, an adult informant, talked about, was that Japanese culture is Buraku culture. And she expanded that Japanese culture wouldn't exist if not for Buraku culture. And she, she described that as things like the taiko drums that you hear in festivals. That was an outcast occupation because it was the leather that was stretched over the drum to make the drum that if we look at calligraphy, the brushes that were used were made from animal hair. So that was an outcast occupation. Even the idea, and this there, this isn't necessarily historically accurate, but children were being, in one of the communities where I studied, was, were being taught this, was that the woman who created kabuki was an outcast woman. So we have these, these markers that we think of high culture in Japan, what it means to be Japanese, um, if you will, that are connected deeply to outcast or buraku experiences. 
this identity can be very much the sense of connecting even closer, even at a deeper level to Japanese culture, however that's defined. But then also for some of the, the people that I interviewed, their Budaku identity isn't necessarily their sole defining characteristic either. Many of them talked about the fact that they were they were a brother, an uncle, a mother, a sister, a daughter, and Budakumi, right? So it was simply one of the many categories that they would have um, in terms of their social identity. So for some, it was a defining characteristics, but for others, it was one of many characteristics that they had. Now, you went and did research on two different Buraku communities, as you mentioned. So tell us about your findings based on that research and how does it stand out? What does it bring to the table that other studies on Burakumin have not in the past? So the, the work that I did, I, I spent time in two different uh, Buraku districts, one that I called Takagawa, the other one I called Kuromatsu. And these are both pseudonyms. There are no real places named Takagawa or Kuromatsu. What I did is I spent a year in these two different communities taking classes with junior high school students and then interviewing those children. And subsequently, I followed them through the last year of compulsory education, through um, third year of junior high school and into adulthood. The two communities, Takagawa took, um, as I alluded to, a very open approach um, encouraging children to be open with being Budokmin, be proud of being Budokmin. Kuromatsu took an approach that said, if we keep talking about Budaku issues, that will continue discrimination. And so we won't talk about Budaku discrimination. We won't talk about, we should talk about eliminating all forms of discrimination, not highlighting one form over another. One of the things I think that my, my work, I guess, has done that hasn't been done in other research on Budaku issues, at least in, as far as English research has gone, is that it's looking at young people, children to young adults, and kind of how, how do they learn about Budaku issues, and how do they then think about that and present themselves to others as, as Budaku mean, or do, how do they silence that? So your time in the neighborhoods of Buraku mean, where you got to interview uh, many students in junior high school. What was your impression about how different they their lifestyles are compared to people in Tokyo, for instance, or any other quote-unquote normal Japanese neighborhood? How has the identity of these Buraku people affected their lives? In terms of the living conditions, in terms of how we might think about um, what those communities looked like, it really varies. Um, I went to one community with some friends from a Buraku district in Osaka to one of my field sites when I first went there, and they were convinced the Buraku side of town was non-Buraku, and that the non-Buraku side of town was the Buraku side of town in terms of how the infrastructure was, what the houses looked like, what the, the community looked like in, in terms of a geographic and infrastructural perspective. In that sense, it, it's not that we can say, how does it compare to a quote-unquote normal or majority community, but rather it's really, there, there is no one type of Buraku community, just as there is no one type of majority Japanese community. So in that sense, it's hard to say on a national level, how does one, one area compare to another? But in terms of how does that affect the identities of people, I think in particularly in a community that was very open about talking about Buraku issues, one of the ways that I, I like to think about it is that that community, by by embracing Buraku issues so much and encouraging the children to have a very open um, Buraku identity and be open with who they are as Buraku, mean, is that it does create an identity while they're in the community, right? An identity of of belongingness, of being open with being Buraku, mean, so long as they're in that particular area. That means that they can not necessarily share that background when they're outside of that community. Um, it's still part of who they are, but it isn't, as I said, it's not their sole characteristic. They can choose not to share that background when they're outside of the community. But being in a community that embraces it, uh, embraces a Buraku identity, encourages them to be open and embrace that themselves when they're in that area. You mentioned a bit earlier about a type of education that these Buraku students receive. Can you tell us more about that? 
So Takagawa was very much this open approach and open education. The, that school had several classes spread out throughout the academic year. They were typically held for a month at a time over three different months, um, once a week during that month. The classes would, would address Baraku experiences, outcast experiences, and it really tried to teach the children, again, the, this positive of being, being Budakumi. They would have guest speakers come in, uh, adults, their parents' age, talking about marriage discrimination and how they overcame that. They would have high school children come in and talk about what, what they experienced when they left Takagawa in terms of how did they interact with the broader society. And that educational approach very much fostered this encouraging um, engagement with Buraku issues of being proud to be Buraku mean, knowing that they will face discrimination when they go out um, into the broader society. And in Kudomatsu, that was missing entirely. And there, Buraku issues simply were not talked about. Um, as one, one student um, I talked with described it as we studied it that one day um, rather than having class upon class about Baraku issues. It was that one day. So there it was very much, this is not part of, of the educational experience. This is not something we really talk about. On one hand, I see that those classes definitely encourage Baraku mean to be positive about their identity. But on the other hand, doesn't it also discriminate them in a way, taking them to extra classes, taking them out of extracurricular activities, giving them extra work? Well, in, in those classes in Takagawa, those were actually regular classes. And so Baraku and non-Baraku students were taking those classes. They were differentiated by first year, second year, and third year groups, grades, pardon me. And this is an important point to realize that studying about Baraku experience or discrimination as a whole isn't just something that those discriminated against need to understand. It's something that the majority needs to understand as well. And that was the approach that Takagawa took, that Buraku discrimination is a problem. It's not a Buraku mean problem. It's a majority Japanese problem um, because they're the ones doing the discrimination, not the Buraku mean. And so for the Takagawa schools, their approach was, this is something that everybody needs to understand. Now, Kuramatsu, prior to my going there as, as for research, it did have after-school classes for um, kind of extra study sessions that were targeting the students from the Budaku district. Now, that didn't take them out of class, but what it did is it did take them out of club activities, after-school club activities. And so that, much as you, you rightly pointed out, would then mark them as different as somehow leaving, they would once a week, they would leave their club activities to go to these after-school sessions. Now, I interviewed um, a woman who had been at, at the school in, in Kuramatsu during that period when they did offer those after-school classes, and she said she didn't really have an understanding that it was Buraku-based, but that it was certain kids would go there And rather than feeling like, oh, what's wrong with those kids? She actually felt like, oh, those kids are so lucky. They get to have these extra sessions and extra time with the teachers. And so for her perspective, at least, in looking back, it was a positive that those kids were getting extra after-school help. And so those classes were not about Buraku experience or Buraku history. Rather, those classes were about sort of extra study time, extra preparation for classes for entrance exams, things like that. So for, at least for those students, it was not about Buraku issues, but more about preparation for the broader society. So you're saying that some Japanese people might see those classes as a preparation, as something good, but does it address then actually the issue of seeing Burakumin as Burakumin rather than just merging them with the normal Japanese society? Is it then not missing the point actually of showing Japanese people that they're not different? So I think in, in that community, again, it was taking these, these children out of their club activities, but because that, that community didn't really talk about Buraku issues at all, as, as she said at the time, she had no idea that it was the children that were Buraku. She didn't know that. Um, later on, she did know. She, she learned and, and understood what was happening as an adult, because in part because she became a teacher, but she didn't really have that understanding 
um, when she was a child. So she didn't really have that sense of, oh, they're being taken out and they're being marked as different somehow. Again, these were these were classes that were sort of extra tutorial sessions for math or for um, Japanese language or social studies or things like that. But it did it did serve the in a way it did serve a purpose to further sort of separate and marginalize rather than having those classes for everybody. Which I I, I agree. I think that would have been a a really effective way of saying okay, let's open these classes up to everybody so we can have extra classes for anybody who wants a little more tutorial. For doing this kind of work, the students that you interviewed, what did they think about these classes? So the the students from Takagawa that I interviewed, while they were in school, very much liked these classes. They found them helpful. It gave them a sense of what both historical outcast groups had gone through, but even kind of what their parents had gone through. As one of them said about when the woman、uh, woman came in. Uh, to talk about marriage discrimination, one of the students said, "You know, my parents had a similar thing. My dad's Budokami, my mom's not. And if they hadn't overcome that discrimination, I wouldn't be here." So for them, it was this very much this real set of experiences about what it means to be Budokami. So while they were there, they found it as a very much a positive kind of experience. That said. When they left, as they they got older and had more sort of broader social experiences,、um, as one of them told me when she was in college, she found that looking back, the education she had, she understands why she had that education about teaching the children that they will face discrimination, that、um, there are ways to challenge discrimination, but to be prepared for it. She said, looking back, she understands why they did it. But it also meant that she she said she felt it was very hard for her to make friends and become close to people as an adult because she kept wondering if things that people were saying or the way that people were acting was because she was Budokami, and that's how she was interpreting it because she had been taught you will face discrimination, and so for her that that approach of being open and Learning about all these positives of Budaku experience, in a way, were actually counterproductive. They didn't. They made it harder for her to interact in broader society. So, for her at least, it was it was good at the time. But she also sees it not necessarily as a, an exclusively positive perspectives. Could I ask you on that?、Um, so, most of these, let's say, extra classes you've mentioned earlier, or these classes where basically Budaku mean and non Budaku mean are together, they happen during school time. Is there anything、um, for adults, for example, in that case, who where they can basically embrace、um, their Budaku mean culture in a way?、Um, yes. So, in, again, this is primarily in Takagawa because of the the silence that was surrounding Budaku issues in Kudomatsu, but in Takagawa. There were a whole host of activities. They would have a series of lectures, guest speakers who would come in and talk about Budaku issues, and they would have for elderly people. They would actually have、um, literacy classes, so people who were coming in who had had to drop out of school for economic or other reasons when they were younger,、so、they could go to literacy classes、um, to learn how to write. In Takagawa, they also had what was known as the Kaiho no Matsuri. Or festival of liberation, and that was a festival. It was a summer festival, but it was very much targeting the Budaku experiences, and it would it would be very much a, a an embracing of Budaku identity for residents of of Takagawa, Budaku mean or not even, and that that was probably the biggest single place to have this sort of. Embracing and learning more about Budaku identity and Budaku experiences in, in that community. Bento Bureau will be resuming shortly after this break. As you have all noticed, Bento Bureau is a part-time podcast. We at Bento Bureau are all university students, and we can only devote so much time on this project. With that in mind, we would like to express our deepest appreciation to our listeners who have been with us since the beginning. We would also like to say thanks to James from ALT Insider for his support and his words of encouragement. We would also like to thank Tim from 
Japan Society Northwest, Amina Asante from Black in Japan, Yuri Kashibe from UCL Japan Society, and SOAS Japan Society for sharing our podcast on social media. Do Barakumi actually want to um, embrace their identity if they are kind of ostracized by standard Japanese society? <laughs> That's a really good question. And I, I don't want to say what Barakumi do or don't want to do, um, because I think that's, it's, one, it's not my position to say what, what they do or don't want to do, but I think this, this is a tension. Why would somebody be out and be Barakumi when that means potential discrimination? at least from what some of my informants have said, is that it's part of who they are. It's not their sole characteristic. Maintain that identity based upon how they understand the situation. They're not actively hiding that they're Budokmin, but it doesn't come up in their everyday interactions with people. And as one of my informants said, if somebody says something discriminatory, she will call them out on it, and she will say she's Budokmin, and that's discriminatory, but that in her everyday life, those kinds of discussions don't typically come up. There's no reason for her to be openly expanding on being Budokamine to everyone she meets. In that sense, that Budoko identity is much like any other type of identity that isn't necessarily apparent. We don't share a whole host of our own backgrounds with people that we don't necessarily know, particularly if it's something that's beyond what we think is visible, right? Whether it's our, our we think we understand race or we think we understand gender, and if it's beyond any of those, if the person doesn't share those, if the person doesn't come out, we wouldn't necessarily know. And so a person might choose not to share what their background is, not out of, not out of a stigma, not out of, a, oh, I might get discriminated against, but rather they might view it as, well, this, is, this situation doesn't call for sharing this part of my background or this part of who I am. Wouldn't the problem be solved actually by not bringing it onto the surface because when they can choose in their normal life that um, I'm going to share the information that I'm welcoming or not is basically up to them so they can just say I'm not going to share it then the problem would be solved wouldn't it I don't think it's that simple because even if they don't want to share their identity their the place that they live their neighborhood or even their last name still show that they Buraku and that's something that you can hide easily so, so this idea about how do we how do we eliminate Budaku discrimination? The other community where I did the research took more of that view um, that if we talk about Budaku discrimination, people will, will be aware of it and they will continue to discriminate. But if we don't talk about it, younger people don't know, don't care, it will gradually disappear. That's a, a lovely idea except it doesn't really hold in any sort of reality. And as, as you pointed out, this idea that um, there's a localized knowledge that's still there. You might know an, a local name, just to pick Suzuki as, as a random name. Suzuki might be a, a name in a Budaku community in one part of the country, but then another part, Suzuki, is not a, Budaku, a name in a Budaku district. So it's not that it's the same throughout the country there either. But... This idea of, of sort of localized knowledge may continue to know about, okay, this is where somebody with this name or who lives in this part of the, the city, that, will, that knowledge continues. And then my, my general take is that silence doesn't solve social problems. Not talking about it as a society, I think, doesn't help us understand what's going on with Budaku issues. And, and I think understanding and knowing about it and talking about it is a better way of addressing some of these issues. That said, I wouldn't dream of saying that all, all Budaku mean have to come out. Right? I think that's, that's an individual decision that people should have the agency and have the ability to make on their own. But I do think that being aware, having an awareness of Budaku issues, not not to say that certain groups should be outed, but an awareness of Budaku issues in general, I think, is a positive to be more aware of sort of inequality, more broad discrimination that happens in a society.
From your perspective, now these communities, the ones that have the Burak, I mean, especially in the in one of them at least, they've been taking steps to really address the issue. What about the government's role in the issue? How, what are the steps that the government has taken in the past few decades to address the issue of uh, discrimination against minorities such as Burakumin? So the government has both played a role in perpetuating discrimination, but has also made an attempt to address discrimination. The biggest sort of single policy that was done by the government to address Buraku discrimination was a series of laws that were in place from 1969 to 2002. And those were collectively known as the Doha laws. Do is onaji of same, and wa is harmony, but it's also in reference to Japanese. And it came out of the imperial proclamation during the war about all Japanese working together. And so the Doha laws provided a whole host of um, benefits and services to Buraku districts that officially registered as Doha districts. And not all Buraku communities registered with the government. So they did not, if they didn't register with the government, they did not receive the aid that the laws provided. Why would they not register with the government, though? Well, partly, um, if you register with the government, then the government has a, a, an official registration of where the Budaco district is. Right? So it becomes another marker that can become a permanent marker of this is a Budaco district. Okay. If you register with the government, right? And, for instance, Tokyo, during that, that period of 69 to 2002, Tokyo did not register any Padaku district as a Doha district. So there are officially no Doha districts in Tokyo, though there are Padaku districts in Tokyo. What that law did is it brought in a fair amount of money to, to improve infrastructure, roads, parks, things like that in Padaku districts. It provided low interest home loans um, for people living in these Doha districts. It provided scholarships for high school, because up until basically right now, compulsory education at the end of junior high school was free. But after that, to go to high school, which 98% roughly do go on to high school, you have to pay tuition for. And the Doha laws provided scholarships for children from Doha districts to go on to high school. It provided an extra teacher, so a increased or a lower student teacher ratio in schools that serve Buraku or Doha districts, and a whole host of um, improvement for industry. This, this is one way that the government really tried to address these issues. And those laws ended in 2002, um, not because discrimination ended or living conditions improved or were, were on par with majority Japanese, but rather um, through a whole host of issues, including an implementation of a different law that addressed broader minority issues in Japan. That said, it was just about one year ago, it was December 9th, 2016, that the, the Diet passed a new law on Budaku discrimination. I'm blocking on the official name now, but it's the, the title is The Law to Resolve Budaku Discrimination, or something to that effect. The law is, it's a new law, it just went into effect okay, just about a year ago, and it's designed to raise more awareness about Budaku issues. And I've interviewed politicians and movement activists about this law. They're all in agreement that the law is a good first step because it, it references Budaku discrimination. It says people should not discriminate, but it doesn't really carry any penalties. So it's kind of don't discriminate, please, kind of feeling to it. And so that law is a, is a first step. It's also the first law that the government has put in that specifically uses the term buraku. That in and of itself is also a very important symbolic step. So that we're actually getting the government to use the term buraku, not to use the term doa or to try to use any kind of other policy term that might not be as clear that it's about buraku issue. This new law is primarily targeting improving or raising awareness about buraku discrimination and also trying to combat online discrimination by groups that have tried to post messages and information about where the Buraku district, uh, districts are and who lives in particular Buraku districts. And how would you evaluate that law? Has it worked over the past year? or I think it's too early to say. In part, what the law has called for hasn't necessarily been 
completely put into effect yet. One one thing the law calls for is a, um, oh gosh, what is it now? It is something to the effect of doing a survey of living conditions, but that hasn't been done because it's not clear who will be doing that. It's called for a, a human rights um, advisor in particular districts, but that's not been necessarily done equally across country yet. So I think I, I would agree with both po- the politicians and the activists that I interviewed that it's a good first step. It's moving towards where it needs to go, but it's not there yet. And it's too early to know exactly what the, the final outcome will be. You mentioned how it is a good first step. It makes it seem like the efforts since the 1960s until the 2000s was not a success. Um, I, I think if... It depends on how we're defining success. I think if we define success as improvement in economic opportunities, improvement in living conditions, improvement in educational outcomes, then yes, it was probably a success. And that's that's sort of what the, the goal of the Doha laws were. The Doha laws did not attempt to raise awareness or improve, in, eliminate work to eliminate discrimination, which you know, I don't know how plausible that actually is. But I don't think the Doha laws necessarily did anything to address discrimination. And there still isn't any direct penalty for discrimination against Badakami, even with this new law. Um, there's no as I said, there's no penalty to it. So I think the Doha laws were successful in, in what they were doing, though I wouldn't say that they, they certainly didn't eliminate discrimination, but they did improve con- living conditions and opportunities. The new law, because it's now at least addressing Buraku discrimination, is a first step in that sense to address Buraku discrimination. But we'll have to see how much it actually can do or will do for that. Now, with that new law being introduced since last year, which path do you see research research going from here on out? I, well, I'll, I'll probably always do work one way or another with Buraku issues. Um, what I'm working on right now is kind of a broader process of looking at the representations of minorities in textbooks and looking at how sort of textbooks, which are presented as quote-unquote official knowledge of what we expect all residents or all citizens of a country to learn, and looking at how, how minority issues are represented in those textbooks, but then also interviewing teachers who teach to those populations. And how do they deal with some of these gaps? For instance, um, a textbook company that, that has a very large share of the junior high school market in Japan, in their 200 some odd page social studies textbook, they have 11 lines on Budaku issues. And those 11 lines are primarily historical. I'm, I'm interviewing teachers as well to see how do the teachers then deal with the actual conditions and actual experiences of these children versus how their their experiences or their histories are being presented in the textbook. And it's looking at Japan, um, the US, and the UK as a comparative uh, study. Well, talk a little bit more about your field of work. Where can people find your research? My, the book is available on Amazon. Um, and I've done I've published a couple of other pieces on Budaku issues. Um, Ian Neary, Tim Amos... Noah McCormick and um, Joe Hankins are probably the, the main people, if you will, who are looking at some of these issues. But there's also um, scholars doing work on literature and things. And I'm, I'm just thinking more on the social science side here. Well, this subject is so broad and there's just a million things we could talk about it. And we try to give a good idea of the issues, the social issue of Burakumin in Japan. Thank you so much for being part of the episode. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. That's all for our episode on the minority group of Furakumin with Christopher Bondi. We hope you learned something new from this episode. Now, as always, if you're interested to learn more about Japanese society from an international perspective, Bento Bureau is the place to be. We're always working hard to produce new content for you.
If you like what we are doing here at Bento Bureau, please consider supporting us by liking our social media pages such as Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at Bento Bureau. We're also now available on the SoundCloud platform, a great platform in my opinion. So if you prefer that model, you can go there and you please like our episode, share it with your friends if you liked it, of course. And leave us your comments, leave us your feedback. We're always looking to improve. Go, Chiso, Samadesta!